Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Crossroads. It's good to see you, and I want to invite you to take out your teaching outlines as we are continuing our message series, Overcoming Excuse Abuse. And it seems like uh, life could be summed up in that way, that it's overcoming one excuse after another, and one by one, by God's grace, we can overcome that which would holds us back. And uh, this morning, I want to talk with you about a very important excuse that we make sometimes, and I believe that this excuse is at the heart of our own heart, um, spiritually, mentally, physically, relationally, in every area of our life. And I want to talk with you this morning about the stingy excuse. And this is uh, what I would like to define as the stingy excuse. You'll notice this in the top of your outline. The stingy excuse. Ungenerous to give because of unwillingness. Ungenerous to give because of an unwillingness. Now, I realize that that unwillingness could be for, for several reasons. The most common reason that that could be is because we're a little tight sometimes. When we talk about giving, it's the understanding that we give of our time, uh, we give of our resources, we give to God. And sometimes we're unwilling to do those things, give to others. We're unwilling to do those things because we're a little tight. And especially when it comes to money, I think all of us would, would love to have a little bit more money and a lot less month so we could pay, pay a lot more bills that we're struggling with. But when it comes to being tight, you know, sometimes we're like the man who ran into his boss and said, I need a raise, I need a raise. And the boss said, why do you need a raise for? He goes, well, three other companies are after me. So the boss looked at him and said, what three other companies? And he said, the mortgage company, the telephone company, and the electric company, they're after me. That's why I need a raise. There was another man who commented on the state of his own personal economy and the economy in general. He said, I'm a walking economy. My hairline is in recession. My waist is a victim of inflation. And together they're putting me in a deep depression. Sometimes we're tight. Another reason why we're unwilling to be generous sometimes is because we're just greedy. We're greedy. And sometimes we can be so greedy that our mind is warped thinking everything revolves around us. Reminds me of the story of uh, the man and, and who was married to uh, supposedly the love of his life. Uh, they had no children together. Um, they had an asset. They had a, a house that was their big asset. And then they had a few, uh, a few shekels in the bank, uh, $236,000 in the bank. And much to her surprise, in the will, he put that he wanted to be buried with his house and all the money. And so, um, I guess uh, heaven has a sense of humor, he went before she did. And she followed his wishes. She buried him with a copy of the deed of the house and a check for $236,000. So she buried him with his money. Sometimes we could get so greedy that we lose sight of of what matters and we could become unwilling and obviously uh, that is not God's best for our life. He wants us to be people who are generous, who are open-handed because he knows what it does for our heart. I like to think of generosity this way. Um, generosity is to selfishness what kryptonite is to Superman. It really is. If you want to deprogram a selfish heart, be a generous giver. Now, there have been lots of books that are written on how to uh, double your income and how to uh, triple your portfolio and expand your assets. But the greatest story written about the greatest giver of all time is Jesus Christ. He's the greatest giver of all time because he gave the ultimate sacrifice his life. And by definition, um, to be a Christian should be to be a generous soul a generous person, that that indeed is the will of God for our life. Take it a step further. Look at the counsel of the entire Bible. You may be surprised to know these facts, but there are 2,350 verses in the Bible concerning the use of money and material possessions. In three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, one out of every six verses has to do with stewardship, how we manage ultimately what we have. 
And then what's interesting is that nearly half of Jesus' parables are on this topic. And then take it a step further. Jesus spoke more about how we manage what we have more than he spoke about heaven and hell combined. I would say that it's a pretty important topic. So much so that Jesus said, and if you know this verse, you can finish it with me, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus said, lay your treasures up where? In heaven. Because God knows in his infinite wisdom, obviously God owns it all. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Heaven's not going broke regardless of the state of the economy. But it's so important for us to realize that God has enabled us to give. It is an opportunity that God has placed before us. And it always has meanings that tru truly transcend where we are right now. How many of you seen the movie um, Gladiator years ago that starred with Russell Crowe? What a great movie that was. And right before they went off in the battle, I remember what uh, Russell Crowe said, or Maximus. For a while, I wanted to name my son Maximus Aurelius, but that got voted down. Um, that, was, it didn't get, that didn't get accepted into the bank, the name bank. But Maximus on his horse said, what we do today echoes into eternity. And that is so true for our lives. What we do today echoes into eternity, especially when it comes to that which is in our hand. To whom much is given, the Bible tells us, much is expected. And it's Jesus who has repeatedly in his word counseled us to be good stewards. And truly, how could God trust us with heavenly riches if we can't take care of the earthly riches that we have here and now? This is just a warm-up act. We're just passing through. Our citizenship is in heaven. We've talked uh, last year in great detail in our Beyond series about the beauty of heaven and what awaits us there. This is just temporary. And whether you have a lot or you have a little, don't get caught up in those ancillary facts that's celebrated by Hollywood and the media. Focus on God having you. That's what's most important. And if God has you and He has your heart, He'll find a way in His infinite love and wisdom to give you contentment to deal with the little that you have and wisdom to deal with the much that you have so that whether you're in the valley or you're climbing up the mountain or you're on top of the mountain, your eyes will be fixed on the author and perfecter of your faith. And your comfort level will not be determined by the size or lack thereof of your bank account. But definitely generosity is one of those things that God has put within us as human beings as we've been endowed by our Creator. God has put it within us and I believe generosity is one of those ways that God draws us closer to Him. There's numbers of ways, there's, there's numerous ways that God does that, but generosity by far, that is the one that breaks the yoke of selfishness. That's the one that matures us. In fact, uh, how many of you are parents of, of children that are under the age of 16? Okay? And how many have kids that are older than six, that under the, over the age of 16 but still act like they're under the age of 16? Anybody? Okay, just a few. Okay. Well, what's one of the old, the, the old uh, forms of parenting? Is you give your child responsibilities, not because you can't do it, because you're teaching them how to be useful. You're teaching them, you're not going into a discourse about it, you're teaching them to mature. Because you understand as a parent, more is caught than taught. And so certainly you could, you could clean up their room ten times faster than they could, but you have them join you in the process. And you even sing a cute little song with it. Clean up, clean up, everybody everywhere. And you know, you, and what it's doing is you're inviting the child to help with you. And that goes on as you get older. One of the most sincere moments I ever had with my five-year-old son, Joseph, was when we were painting the living room. And obviously, I, don't, I didn't necessarily need him to help me do that, but he wanted to help. And I can't tell you how many times, uh, you, and if you're honest, you, you try to solicit an I love you out of your child. You know, you never stop doing that. And for the first time ever, without any uh, a toy was given or a promise was made, I let him help me paint. And there was this, uh, this bureau that was left in the house that we live in there, this nice uh, old-fashioned piece. And and I pushed it out, and it's pretty big, but I could look back, and I watched him paint, and he was just so happy. I could see the smile on his face because he was participating with me in his father's work. 
And he looked over to me, and with complete joy on his face, unsolicited from me, he said, Dad, I said, yes. He says, I love you. And that melted my heart. And it melts the heart of God when we partner in his work, and it gives us an unspeakable joy that it produces an unsolicited love for God. When it comes to generosity and the church, there is to be no haranguing, there's to be no twisting of the arm, because giving is a privilege. It's a blessing from God. And all we have to do is consult the Scriptures. In the New Testament, there is no percentages affixed to giving or serving. It's all voluntary. It's all a part of worship. It's all necessary to grow closer to God. It's a part of that great commandment that Jesus gave to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. It's all wrapped up into that. It's the beauty of it. It's the beauty of our walk with God. Giving is a, is a privilege. It's a blessing from God to be involved in His work that He has, doesn't even need us to do, but He invites us to do it. And there's illustrations throughout the Scripture on it. And my favorite passage to teach from is not an Old Testament passage on this. It's a New Testament one. And it conditions us to be anything but stingy. And it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And so turn there with me. Because of my lengthy introduction, I have to make up for a little time here in the air. So as your pilot, I'm going to try to do that now through these, eight, these first eight verses here. But we approach 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and the first word of it, moreover, marks a transition and allows me to expound upon the context. Uh, there had been some conflict between the Apostle Paul and the people he's writing to, the book of Corinthians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, is obviously written to the church at Corinth. Corinth in itself had uh, uh, numerous uh, superlatives about its particular region, as well as its church. They were a very affluent church in a very affluent part of uh, the world at this time. Their church flourished in many different ways. One of them was financial. Paul had had some issues with the church that produced, as we like to call it, a little agita. Gave him a little stress. This particular church had numerous moral issues and uh, issues of integrity. Paul would have to uh, insert and remind them of his apostleship. In the previous chapters, they kiss and make up. We come to chapter 8, and Paul's going to return to a very important topic. And in chapter 8 and chapter 9, he's going to remind the Corinthian church that he wants them to participate in a special offering that needs to be given over to the church of Jerusalem, the very first church. The church of Jerusalem, as we know, swelled an incredible population because uh, of the time of Christ, the Passover, the ascension, um, the, the mass conversions of people wanting to sit at the feet of the apostles. And so you have a very large amount of people uh, who have come from out of town, who have left their town. Some have lost jobs because they've gotten baptized, obviously saved and baptized. So there's a tremendous hospitality need and the Apostle Paul is looking and seeking to raise an offering to take to the church of Jerusalem. And so we join this in verse 1. It says, moreover, marking that transition, brethren. So they've kissed and they've made up. Now we're, we're brethren again. Before it may have been, you know, you pain in the neck. Now it's back. To, it's brethren. We want to make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. And so what Paul is going to do is, Paul's going to tell the Corinthian church about a group of other churches. He's going to tell them about the Macedonian churches. Now, who are the Macedonian churches? Well, first of all, uh, the Roman providence of Macedonian, Macedonia, uh, the ancient kingdom of Alexander the Great, uh, the churches in Macedonia that Paul had in mind consisted of Philippi, who we're learning about every Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, you don't want to miss that, Berea, the church of Berea, and the church of Thessalonica. And so Paul is going to tell the Corinthian church, I want to let you know about what's going down in Macedonia. Because it's an incredible example of generosity. We want to make known to you the grace of God. And you want to circle that word grace because it's by God's grace. It's not by their human efforts. It's not by philanthropic efforts. We want to make known to you the grace of God that's at work in their life. The saving grace of God has produced a generosity in the Macedonians' hearts. 
Now, we're going to go on to find out a little bit about their particular context. Because we know what's going on in Jerusalem, an incredible amount of population. Throw in the fact that there has been a famine. There's a great need in Jerusalem. But there's also a great need going on presently in Macedonia. It says in verse 2 that in a great, and that word great means many in the Greek language, trial of affliction. So they have a lot of affliction. That word affliction in the Greek language is uh, thylipsis. It means pressure, uh, the equivalent of stepping on grapes. Pressure and squashing grapes that the Macedonian church, they have a lot of pressure on them. And we'll chronicle that more in just a moment. But it says that in their great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy. Now you wouldn't think those two things go together. Great affliction and abundance of joy. That word abundance means surplus. That they have a surplus of joy. They have extra joy in their life. And deep poverty, and that word deep um, in our English secular vernacular would be to hit rock bottom. Maybe you felt like that once or twice in your life. Or the pits. You've hit rock bottom financially. Uh, that they, are hit, they have hit rock bottom. They are poverty stricken. But they're abounded in the riches of their liber liberality. And liberality means sincerity. It's the opposite of duplicity. That they have a sincerity in how they're conducting themselves. This church, these churches in Macedonia. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift of the fellowship of ministering to the saints. Saints in the Scriptures are those who believe in Christ, not just people who we think are perfect. The Bible didn't canonize anybody. Anybody who believes in Jesus Christ, you're in the sainthood of believers. And so he's, Paul is saying that they were urging us. They came to us and said, when are you going to come and take this offering so we can go give it to the church in Jerusalem? They were urging us in the middle of all of their hardships, in the middle of all of their disaster, in the middle of all of what was going on in their life, they were still steadfast and they were imploring us to give. Verse 5 and says, and not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. They first gave themselves to the Lord. And that word first translates uh, protos in the Greek language. It means priority. That God was their number one priority. And then to us by the will of God. They submitted to us as their leaders. So we urged Titus, uh, Titus, one of the workers, uh, with Paul, one of the ministers, that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. You need to do this as well, Corinthian church, he says. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. What do these first seven verses tell us? The churches in Macedonia had a lot, of, a lot going on. And they had every opportunity to make an excuse to be stingy. They could have easily been stingy. They could have pointed to numerous excuses as to why they could not be generous, as to why they could not contribute. And I want to highlight a few of them for you, and perhaps we can see ourselves in sometimes in this stingy excuse here. The first excuse is pressure. They felt intense pressure, and that pressure was from persecution. That's what that word means, affliction. They had intense pressure on them. They were persecuted in several ways. The first way that they were persecuted was that if you were a carpenter or a metal worker, you had whatever wages you made, a portion of that wage had to be given to the worship of false idols. Well, guess what? If you were a believer, you weren't doing that. And so it was hard to get paid for your craft in this particular region. Another reason for persecution is that the one that these people follow, they just crucified not too long ago. It's not exactly popular to be a Christian at this particular point in history, regardless of who's on the throne. And so there was persecution. There was pressure from that. Secondly, poverty. And the poverty for the Macedonian churches resulted in high taxes, there was five civil wars. The annals of Rome tell us that as we study history. They had low economic status and as slavery as well. There was also famines that hit this region of Macedonia in this particular time that Paul is writing about. 
In addition to that, they had other persecutions. You can go to Acts chapter 17. tells you all about it, 5 through 7. You know, they had poverty. They had pressure. They could have easily used those as excuses, but they didn't do it. Secondly, potential. They could have said, you know what? We're, we don't see the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow anytime soon. We're looking at the 10-day forecast, and it's calling for 10 more miserable days. Uh, there's no cloudy with a chance of meatballs here. It's not looking good at all. Potential. They could have said we lack potential, but they didn't do it. Paul says that beyond their ability, yes, even well beyond it, they went beyond what we even thought they can do. They went beyond that. The Macedonian church, the suffering church of the Scriptures, the Macedonians, even beyond their circumstances. Priorities. Paul says they first gave themselves to the Lord. Right there is enough to just shut the Bible. We go home and just meditate on that until next Sunday. They put themselves first in the offering plate. They gave themselves first to the Lord. God was not some, you know, take it out and put it back in when it's convenient type of faith. Jesus was everything to them. Paul says that this talking about priorities, he's not talking about, well, they this is the first time they gave themselves to the Lord. He's not, talk, he's not talking that way. He's talking about in terms of their priority. Protos, priority, that, they, that God was their number one priority. And they could have easily become jaded because of their overwhelming obstacles. But they didn't let it stop them. And God does that to us. He gives us these opportunities to keep on keeping on because He knows there's going to be obstacles in our life that we need to keep on keeping on. That if we're not careful, we'll quit. Or we'll listen to everybody else who tells us to give up. And God allows us to go through these circumstances to build within us an endurance that you can't learn in a seminar. It doesn't matter how many, how, how many messages you hear. You have to experience these afflictions, these pressures that the Macedonian churches were going through so that your priorities could be etched in stone and their priorities were God. And then finally, Paul tells them to the Corinthian church, as I'm letting you know about this amazing church over in Macedonia, these churches there, I want you to take a look at your own heart. In the same way you're excelling, and he's going to list some spiritual gifts here. Because as we know, is, and if you're new to the Bible, the church at Corinth struggled with pride. They were so caught up in their spiritual gifts that Paul had to, in the middle of his discourse, on spiritual gifts. He had to give a whole chapter, the love chapter. It's read at everybody's wedding. Nobody knows what the, what the snots it means, but we read it at weddings and we put it on invitations and everything else. But it's right there in the smack of, of it all where Paul says, listen, if you're going to be any type of person, and this could apply to a wedding, a husband, a wife, whoever, this is what love is. I'm not sure anybody has any heart in wanting to do that unconditional love, but hey, this is what love is. And the Apostle Paul is going to tell them the same way that you're abounding in these spiritual gifts, make sure you're abounding in your generosity. And sometimes we can make an excuse, and the Macedonian church could have made excuses. Well, we're good at this. We don't need to be good at generosity. I'm good at this. I don't need to worry about being generous because I'm good at so many other things. So these are all potential excuses that the Macedonian churches could have made. But they didn't do it. They still gave, Paul said. And they urged Paul to give. And you know, I am happy to say that in the 11 years of having the privilege to teach on Sunday and in other capacities here at our church, I have never once pressured anyone into giving, nor have I ever felt the need. God has supplied every time for this church. And I give Him all the glory for that. There will never be a thermometer on the wall. There will never be a, a you're robbing God sermon from here. I will always do my job as your pastor to remind you of the blessing of generosity that Christ has put before us and how it could bless so many others as we are generous and how we are truly being like Christ when we're generous and how it raises all boats in the harbor of our life when we're generous like Christ. And so when it comes to giving, knowing why we give 
empowers generous giving. Manipulation, you know what that does? That discourages people. More people have left church, not because the church necessarily didn't have programs. Churches have so many programs, they can't keep up with them. They build buildings to house programs. There's plenty of programs, plenty of ministries. There's not a shortage of that. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of manipulation that goes along. Some of us come from a spiritual, if you want to even call it that, a background where you were manipulated into giving where they tied it to your salvation and your sacraments. You had to pay to get baptized your child. You had, you had to pay to go receive this and you had to go pay to receive that. It, was like, it's almost, it sounds like we're traveling to Brooklyn or New Jersey over the bridge again. She had a big press conference, toll relief. How about we have another press conference? Let's bring a magician in and let the toll disappear. That's the press conference I want to attend. Church is not designed to be a, a, a toll bridge where you pay with every spiritual step of maturity you take. And, you know, years ago, hundreds of years ago, how the confession to a man came into practice was they sold confession certificates. I can assure you, your confession has been paid for in full on the cross by Jesus Christ. You don't have to, you don't have to pay for your confession. It's been paid for. It's been paid in full. Jesus said it so that way. So giving has nothing to do with trying to earn a closer seat to the cross or trying to move up to the emerald zone when you get to heaven. It has nothing to do with that. Giving is so much more than manipulation. You know, it was J.D. Rockefeller, the great American industrialist and philanthropist that said, think of giving not as a duty, but as a privilege. And I think that's right on. Spiritually speaking and coming from this context, there's a reason why we are called to be generous and why we give. And you want to write this first principle down according to the Apostle Paul. We give because others have needs. We give because others have needs. People have needs. People around you have needs. People in other parts of the world have a need. Now, I want to break needs down into two areas so we're all on the same page, literally. There are what you call physical needs. Physical needs, I'm going to lump material needs into that. Food, clothing, any type of domestic needs. People have needs. They need to have their house rebuilt. They, what, what, the needs, whatever physical that you can touch type of needs, those are physical needs. And they cost money to fulfill. The other is spiritual needs. There is no other name by which men can be saved than by Jesus Christ. And it's the church's job. The church has been not given the great suggestion but the great commandment to go and let the name of Christ be known all over the face of the earth. Some of you are here because somebody gave you a Bible, because somebody invited you to a church, because somebody gave you a track, because somebody loved you enough, just as if they had a cure to a disease and you had it, they loved you enough to tell you about not some religion, because they'd be doing you a disservice. They were telling you about the Son of God who came to this earth, died in your place, and on the third day rose from the dead. And those are needs. People have that need. You can't get into heaven as we know on a Grandma's faith or Uncle Louie's faith or, or Miss McGillicuddy down the street's faith. It has to be your own faith in Christ, obviously by the sovereign grace of God. Therefore, there are needs people have spiritually. Last week when we had our invitation and we called people forward, if you want to come to receive Christ, so many came forward to receive Christ. So many came forward to rededicate their lives. Jesus Christ is in the business of seeking and saving the lost. That's what He's in business to do. He's not in business to build buildings. He's not in business to, build, to buy vans. He's not in business to buy land. He's in business so that each and every person could know the love of God. That's what it's all about. In fact, sometimes you may wonder, why don't God just zap this ball of dirt and take us all home already? 
Oh, because the Son of God is patient. He's patient. He is not, as Peter says, slack in his promise of return. He's just not willing for anybody to perish. And so it's the church's job to care for the needs physically of people, both locally and abroad, and care for the needs of people to know Jesus Christ, both locally and abroad. And that's why Paul says this, I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of who? Others. This is second commandment stuff, right? When Jesus said, what are the two greatest, Jesus said the two greatest commandments, love others as yourself. That's what Paul's referring to here. I'm testing the sincerity of your love for others. Do you care that people have needs? Do you care that your church has needs? Do you care that people need to know Christ? And that the church is in business so that people could know Christ. You might say, you know what? How many services do we want to have here at the church? I look forward to a day when I am preaching and the other men of this church are preaching from Friday to Sunday night. Services, we have, we have, we have, the, we have so many services. I'm looking forward to that because I want the name of Christ to be made known on Staten Island. Not, not the name of anything else. The name of Jesus Christ. Because he, he's the one who saves. Not religion. Not anything, not anything. Christ. Because he saves. And that's why Paul says, that's, why we're, that's what we're doing here. We're making this known to you, Corinth, what's going on in Macedonia. Because Macedonia, in all their trials and tribulations, they care so much. They have made their number one priority to be God. And so it has produced within them a heart to give. Now you flip over your notes, you'll notice how to give correctly. How do you give correctly? Guilt? No. Pressure? No. Get the big men. We got some big juches in this church. Do we get them to hold you up by your feet and shake you out? No. Apologies to the juches. We love you. God loves you. There's, there's a place for you in heaven too. Hopefully. If, yeah, so. How do you give correctly? Purposely from the heart. Purposely from the heart. And passionately from the heart. In the next chapter, in this discourse of talking to the Corinthian church, the Apostle Paul says, so let each one give as he, notice, purposes in his heart. It's a purpose of the heart. God, I'm gonna, I purpose to do this. I purpose to do this. In other words, what you're giving, it, it's a wise strategy to say, the Lord, I want to give you this much a month or a week, however you want to do it before God. Purpose in your heart. You want to be diligent with this. Because what we do today echoes into eternity. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. The decision between you and who? You and God. God is more concerned with your offering coming out of your heart than your wallet or your pocketbook. God cares more about your heart. Not grudgingly or of necessity, not of compulsion, and not, oh, i got to do this again. God says, no, no, hold on to that. For God loves what? A cheerful giver. If you give grudgingly, ah, you don't want to give that way. If you gr give at a duty, that's not even optimal. Well, we got to do it, so we got to keep the lights on right as well. That's not even healthy. You give, thankfully, you're in, you're in the ballpark. You're getting warm. But you give because you want to. Because you know who gave to you. Now that's the way to give. That's a cheerful giver. That's a cheerful giver. And God promises to replenish that which we have sacrificially given over to him. He promises to do that. He promises to bless that heart. And so we give because others have needs. And I close with this last point. We give, and I love this, we give because Christ first gave to us. That's so beautiful. Can we say that together this morning? We give because Christ first gave to us. 
That's why we give. Because he first gave to me, because he first gave to you. That's why we give. Paul says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of Paul's favorite words is grace. For you know, you know Corinthian church because you've been saved by this grace. For you know that it is by grace you have been saved. It's not of yourself that you may boast for. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ God's riches at Christ's expense. God giving us His love and His compassion. God giving us what we don't deserve instead of what we do deserve. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though He was rich. Rich where? What's He talking about? Jesus driving a Lamborghini around? What's He talking about? His throne in heaven, the king of the universe, came down in the form of a child, clothed himself in humanity. As we've been discussing in the Philippian study, as the Apostle Paul said, he was obedient unto death. He endured six unjust trials. The judge of the universe sat in front of three Jewish courts and three Roman courts. Some of those trials he was spit at and beaten and made fun of. The judge of the universe humbled himself, rich in heaven. Paul says, yet for your sakes and for my sakes, he became poor. Scripture says the Son of God, the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. All of heaven, all of the universe, the Creator, the Sovereign God, he became poor for me and for you. No man will ever do that for you. No religion will ever do that for you. You don't need to go kiss somebody's pinky holy ring or you don't need to be harangued into thinking you need to manifest this of the Holy Spirit or that. Just set your eyes right here on verse 9. Yet, for your sakes, He became poor. You don't need to earn your way to heaven. You don't need to make up for all your stupid stuff. And some of us have done a lot of stupid stuff. Has anybody done a lot of stupid things in their life here? I'm just making sure I'm not in the wrong church. I didn't walk into some uh, uh, holier-than-now bunch of holy roller people that sing all the praise songs, but none of them apply to their life, you know. I just want to make sure I'm in the right place. Yet for your sakes he became poor. That you through his poverty, through his poverty, on his dime, on his watch, because of him, because of what he did alone, the soul Redeemer of mankind, through his poverty, you might become rich. That you might become rich. I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel that some of the hooligans are making a mint on. Now we're talking about here. Because you can't take it with you. No matter how much, even like that man, he wanted to be buried with his money. You can't take it with you. So who cares if you get everything you want in this life? There's a citizenship we have to come in heaven, and we set our eyes on that. If you you make a success of your life here, great. Don't forget old Pastor Ray. But the, the greatest things in life are not things. It's not a gospel according to things. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel we need to teach. Not the gospel of toys and things and promotions. It was a gospel of suffering, friends. It was a gospel of poverty. It was a gospel of agony. It was a gospel of beatings. It was a gospel of love. It was a gospel of forgiveness. It's a gospel of victory. It's a gospel of equality at the foot of the cross. It's a gospel of eternal life by way of Jesus Christ. And we must never forget that. We must never forget so great a gift and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And if we are going to be anything but that, we need to check what we're all about. You know, businesses, even our church, we have a beautiful marquee. We have a sign out that says who we are. So people know who we are. This is who we are. I told you when we first moved here, somebody said, you should put your face on there. I said, you really want to get all the pigeons of New York here? 
enrollment and membership will go down, you know, 95% if we do that. We can't put my face on the, on the marquee. I told you I went to one church I used to preach at, and the pastor, he loved himself so much he had his face. After you opened the cover, it said Holy Bible. There was a picture of him in every Bible. Every book they had, the, the, the hymn book, everything. He was everywhere. Yeah. And they had a big picture of himself in the lobby. And, you know, I was young at that point. I was, you know, and, but, you know, being Italian, you, you're always bold, you know, sometimes. Uh, and you put your foot in your mouth. We, Italians suffer from foot and mouth disease uh, from, when, from when you're born. It's just part of who you are. And um, I said to one of the, the leaders there, I said, does this pastor understand that he's just not that good looking? You know, I mean, it'd be one thing if he had a beautiful face. I mean, I guess, you know, plastered around, but he ain't, I mean, it's not like this guy belongs on TV or something. And this guy has a face everywhere. And the thing is, is you got to check the sign of your life. What are you about? Is the sign of your life matching what's supposedly supposed to be inside? Reminds me of when I was on a hospital visit back in 2010. In January of 2010, I was in the city. And I had to go on several hospital visits, and it was late by the time I got done. And you know the city, it don't matter what day it is, it's, tra- it's, it's, it's nonstop work. When are we ever going to get everything done over there? And so there's traffic and everywhere, it takes forever to get. And so I'm driving back, but I'm getting tired. So I said, you know what, I'm going to go stop, and I'm going to go get me. And I had the coupon on me. I'm a coupon man. <laughs> Not ashamed to say it. And here it is from 2010. You could check the, the date afterwards. And I, I, went, I went to go get myself a McFrapp. <laughs> and so I, McDonald's had just, uh, they just ushered this new thing in. I got the coupon. And so I went to go get my McFrapp. And so I went to the McDonald's. I won't get anything else in McDonald's, but I went to go get the McFrapp. And so I drove up to McDonald's, and I, and I go in there, and, and there's the little sign in the window. They have their little uh, fancy advertisement. It looks just like my little Carmel, that one that I wanted to get. And so I went in there. And I went to the counter. I waited online, and you know, people are rude as ever there. And hey, what do you want? And I said, "Well, okay, slow down. Okay, said, you know, I'd like to get a McFrapp." And uh, oh, oh, we don't, we don't have that here. We don't have that here. Well, wait a minute. The, the sign's in the window, and I, you know, you have to, no, we don't have that here. Well, okay, okay. You know, you thought I insulted somebody's mother, but okay, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm going. Okay, I got my car, and then I drove a, a, another few city blocks because you know we need to have a McDonald's on every corner. You know. As a, and a Dunkin' Donuts, you know, and a bagel store and a pizzeria. So, so I found another McDonald's. It was rather close. And I go in there, same deal, sign on the window. I go in, and uh, this was more of a smaller McDonald's, um, so it wasn't a big one. But I went in there, and I said, oh, yeah, I'd like to, have, wait on, I'd like to have the McFrapp. And, uh, oh, 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 we don't have the machine, sir. We don't have the machine. Well, but, but, ma'am, you got the sign on the window. What do you mean you don't have the machine? No, we don't have the machine. Okay. And so at this point, I'm a patient man. But now, I have to admit, I have to be honest with you, confession is good for the soul. I become, I could be patient with people, and there's a lot of annoying people uh, in the church. I understand that. I'm annoying sometimes. I get that. Okay. But, you know, don't get in the way of my need to eat or be fed. (laughs) Don't do that. Don't do that. Because now you're getting me agitated. And now, you know what I'm saying? And now we're getting to the third place here. And I'm on, I've been in three hospitals. And you know, the city hospitals, that's like a, like a mall getting through. And I didn't have my glasses and I, I can't see far. So I got a headache and it's, everything's working against me here. And I got, want to get back home. And so I get to this third McDonald's. And this third McDonald's, this is a big McDonald's, okay? I was, I was waiting for Ronald McDonald himself to open the door. It was so big. And so I, I get in there and this line was long. Everybody in Manhattan was there. And I finally get up there and they had they didn't just have a big sign you know mcdonald's they put a lot into the air campaigns because they have all that money they had a big old you know replica of it and so i said surely this mcdonald's has the mcfrap and so i finally get up there and i said i like a a mocha caramel mcfrap i wanted both of them combined at this point and i held up my little my little coupon like good little boy just like this and she said sure Sir, no, and she starts taking it. No, sir, sir, we don't have that here. And I said, and at this point, I've lost my cool. And I said, lady, if you don't have the machine, then take down the sign. And you know, my friends, if we're not going to be generous, 
like the Lord Jesus Christ, then guess what? Take down the sign. Take the sign down. Take it down. If we're not going to be a church that gives because he first gave to us, guess what? Take down the sign. If we can't be nice to people who are under our own roof, who need Christ, and we don't care about their spiritual needs, guess what, phony? Take down the sign. We don't come to church and talk out of both sides of your mouth and then to hell with everybody the rest of the week. Take down the sign. Because you're doing the cross a disservice. Be real to people. Be everything that you're advertising. Don't let people get to the counter of your life and be somebody else. Don't be greedy with all that God has given to you. That goes for your time, that goes for your talents, and it certainly goes for your treasures. And that goes for me as well. You might think, oh, the pastor, he's got this lick. No, I don't. I'm just like you. I have materialism and other things pulling at my heart just like you do. But we must remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts, he's recorded saying this, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive, according to Jesus. We must be a people who make sure that the sign that's up in our life is advertising what's right. We must be a people that give. We must be a people that look and say, be creative. If my cable bill is more than my offering, I need to work on that. If my Dunkin' Donuts bill is more than my offering, I need to work on that. If I got absolutely nothing, obviously the church might need to help you. That's why you give. And we give because Christ first gave to us. And we give because others have needs. We give because we love God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul. And we give because we want to love others just as we love ourselves. And so God has called you and I, like he called this Corinthian church and like he's holding up this Macedonian church, he's calling you and I to be as advertised that if we know who Jesus Christ is, that we would back up the sign of Christian and we would be a generous people and we wouldn't let the excuses and Perhaps the Macedonian churches could have had reasons of why they didn't give, not just excuses. We wouldn't let the excuses hold us down that in faith we would step forward and give of ourselves to God, give of our time to Him, and watch Him move in our life, give of our resources to Him, give of our love to Him, and watch Him replenish that which is given over to Him. And so, my friends, I encourage you with my heart um, and my passion to say, let's be a generous church. Let's be a generous church, so much so that we have a surplus of our own joy in the midst of whatever hardships we can. So we could take care of our own people in our church that go through hardships and take care of people outside of these four walls in the community that have hardships. And most importantly, we could let the name of Christ be known to a lost and dying island and a lost and dying world because Jesus said it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. What do you think he's talking about? That you're going to get a gold watch at the end of the year? No. What is he talking about? He's talking about heaven. He's talking about when you stand before God and you've laid up your treasures for God that you're going to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Because it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Can we say that phrase one more time? We give because Christ first gave to us. And then we'll close in prayer. We give because Christ first gave to us. Let us pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the cross. And we thank you for your unconditional love. And we thank you, O oh God, that you first gave to us. We thank you that your son Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross. That each person in this church this morning could open their heart to you today. 
Lord, that if they confess you as Savior, if they confess your sin, Lord, with their mouth before you, O oh God, and believe in their heart that you raised your son Jesus Christ from the dead, that they will be saved. That's your promise, O oh God. Lord, we thank you for the cross, and we thank you for your love. We pray that we would be a generous people, O oh God, that any unwillingness we have that may be rooted from past church experiences or myths or things that we thought we knew, that we would push that to the side. Because the only person we're robbing in the end is ourselves. Because it's truly more blessed to give than it is to receive. We pray, O oh God, a blessing over this church that we would become generous in exponential ways that our barns would overflow so that physical needs could be met in the event of an attack or a disaster upon our city again, God, that we would be storing up our barns, O oh God, prepared to help and serve people in need. Lord, for we know we live in an evil world and we know we live in a world where disasters come. And it's the church's job to not only help its own, but to help the community. And Lord, may we store up like Joseph did for the famine so that we could be used of your purposes. And most importantly, Lord God, may we be strong financially so that the light of your gospel can stretch far beyond New Dorp, far beyond the East Shore, far beyond Staten Island, O oh God. That we would be about Your renown. And that when we stand before You in heaven, there will be others that are there that because of Your sovereign plan, You chose for us to partner with You. And may we say we love You because You've given us the opportunity to paint the wall too. We give You all the praise and thanks for which You've given to us. We love because you first loved us, and we give because you first given to us. We sow these prayers in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.